Uh, okay, I'm recording to start right now. So I, I repeat that it's a pleasure to have with us uh, today Matthias Ormani, who is uh, right now in Heidelberg, at the University of Heidelberg. As I have just been informed, it is, it is his last day there when he's move, moving close to London to his uh, new position. Uh, He's for several years now in Hamburg, I guess. Uh, he has uh, done his PhD at Oxford with uh, Professor Bine and uh, Professor Magorian. And uh, he is an expert on uh, dynamical uh, processes that take part in the interstellar medium in galaxies, and especially in bars, which it is uh, exactly the subject that uh, is of interest for several of us here in the audience. And for those that uh, of you that are joining us from abroad, and uh, you see, it is exactly the title suggesting what uh, uh, it will follow about the galactic center. Uh, we're looking forward for listening to your talk, Matia. Thank you for being with us. Let me start. Thank you, Panos, for the nice introduction, and thanks for the for the invitation. So yes. Um, I would like to talk about the, the galactic center of, uh, of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So this is my, my outline. In the first part, I give a general introduction to the gas dynamics in the Barrett Milky Way. Then I talk a little bit about the uh, inflows, how the gas is transported uh, towards the center. And then in the third part, I talk a little bit about star formation. Um, I think I can hear my echo. Maybe you have to- uh, yes, yes. Uh, Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, I, I'll continue. Okay, so I start with this uh, first part. So this is the usual drawing of the, of the Milky Way. The sun is down here at eight kiloparsecs from the center. Uh, the region dominated by the bar, which will be the interest in this talk, is the innermost four kiloparsecs roughly. Then uh, inside you have the central molecular zone uh, with the radius of about 120 parsecs. At the, at the very center, you have the black hole Sagittarius A star. Okay. However, we live inside the Milky Way. So how do we know what the Milky Way looks like from, from the outside? And uh, for this, the gas is key because we can measure this line of sight velocity. Uh, the galaxy is transparent to many radio wavelengths, like the 21 centimeter hydrogen or the CO rotational uh, transitions. And so uh, you get, uh, you, this gives rise to data cubes, which tell you the intensity of radiation at each point in the sky, LB coordinates. I use galactic coordinates. So he, this is uh, how they are defined. The galactic center is here. We are here in the sun and galactic longitude is the angle uh, within the plane and galactic uh, latitude is the angle up and down the plane. And then you also have the intensity also at each uh, line of sight velocity. And uh, with these data cubes it's convenient to uh, average them around uh, B equals zero. So B equals zero is the galactic plane and the gas is confined to a very thin layer around the galactic plane. And so you integrate in the, in the vertical direction essentially. And what you're left with is these uh, longitude velocity plots. So here I show an example of the uh, full sky LB plot uh, from uh, neutral hydrogen. And the galactic center is at, in this, at uh, L equals zero here. And uh, as you move along the X axis, you move along the galactic uh, plane. So here is the galactic center and at the 180 degrees is the galactic anti-center. So you're looking away from the galactic center. And then on the y-axis, you have the line of sight velocity. Uh, and the first step is that we need to uh, learn to interpret uh, these plots. So we start with the simplest possible motion that you can have, which is purely circular motion. And here on the left uh, is the face on view. Uh, so here is the sun. Uh, I show two circular orbits as an example. Here is the galactic center. And on the right is the longitude velocity view. And you see that uh, a, a, a ring is mapped into a line here. Uh, it's a two to one function from XY to LV. So there are two points in XY that correspond to the same point in LV. And then also notice that at L equals zero, so when you look exactly through the galactic center, 
uh, you have velocity equals zero. And that's because the velocity is uh, perpendicular to the line of sight in case of purely circular motion. So uh, L equals zero, you get velocity equals zero. This is important for, for later. So when you put together many of these uh, rings, uh, this is what you get. You fill the, the diagram with this, with this shape. And this was uh, uh, actually the first method that historically has been used to measure the rotation curve of the Milky Way. Because from the envelope of the emission, so the, the envelope of the emission here depends on the velocity curve. For example, here you see I, I, I switch between these two uh, curves and the envelope changes. And so you can invert this and from the envelope measure the velocity curve. And this is okay as long as the assumption of circular motions uh, is okay, which is, for the Milky Way is true outside of the bar region. So outside three, four kiloparsecs from the center. Okay, so this is how far you get uh, with the circular models. Uh, the top uh, panel here is the full sky CO data. Then you have the 21 centimeter data. And here is the simple axisymmetric model. And you see that the, the simple model captures uh, the overall shape of the, um, of, the, of the data. However, when you look into the center, which is where the bar is, then you start seeing a lot of deviations, which uh, now I will discuss. Um, and just as a historical uh, note, uh, using these methods, uh, Ort in 1958, so a long time ago, derived the first face on map of the Milky Way. So here is the sun. And even at that time, Ort already realized that uh, something weird was going on in the innermost uh, three kiloparsecs. So he left a slice here empty because he thought, okay, the assumptions that I'm using to derive this map, they, they don't work here. The circular motions are, are not correct. Okay, so let's have a look, a closer look uh, at the central part. Uh, so here is a zoom in uh, in the innermost 30 degrees, which correspond roughly to four kiloparsecs uh, from the center. Here is the galactic center. And the most uh, obvious uh, proof that there are no evidence that there are non-circular motions in the galactic center is any emission that is coming from these two red boxes. This is called forbidden velocities, which just means forbidden to purely circular motion. So anything that is on a circular orbit cannot produce any emission in these, in these boxes. But because you have emission, you know that there are non-circular motions in the galactic center. Then you have features like this one that is called the three kiloparsec arm, which crosses L equals zero at velocity minus 53 kilometers per second. And so it cannot be on circular orbit because I showed you before that for something in circular orbit, L equals zero means V equals zero. Then you have uh, like this feature here, which is called the connecting arm. You have these very high velocity peaks, which are uh, faster than the velocity of the sun around the galactic center. So why is the velocity so high here? And so on. So what causes all these features? In the early days, uh, these forbidden velocities, for example, were interpreted as expanding motions. People thought, oh, okay, I can explain all these diagrams putting uh, radial motions. So maybe there is a big uh, explosion in the galactic center and everything is expanding. However, meanwhile, it also became established that the Milky Way is actually a barred galaxy. And today, we interpret most of these features as uh, caused by strong non-circular motion uh, due to the bar. Just to give you an idea of how strongly non-axisymmetric is the gravitational potential created by the bar, here is the Milky Way uh, bar density reconstructed from, uh, from star counts. So you see that is a, is a very, very elongated structure. The, the sun is down here and you get, uh, so the, the potential generated by this is also very non-axisymmetric. Okay. So now we need to understand the effects of the non-circular motions on the LB plots. And let's start with the small non-circular motion and then discuss later the strong non-circular motions driven by the bar. So here is the circular orbit that I showed before. And now I make it slightly non-circular. You can see it's it's barely noticeable in the in the xy plane the non circularity, but here in the LB diagram the the orbit opens up. Now what happens if you put together many of these non, slightly non circular orbits and you have a the major axis slowly rotating with with radius? You get this. So in the xy plane you get 
uh, weak uh, kinem um, kinematic spiral arms, let's say, but they're, they're, they're weak. However, in the LV plane, you get very strong traces uh, of these spiral arms. So when you look at these LV plots, you can, you can actually see the spiral arms of the Milky Way, only you cannot see them in the space where you maybe would you would like to see them from the face on perspective. It's a more abstract space, but still these, these uh, ridges are the spiral arms of the Milky Way. And this is the, uh, the most, uh, the strongest proof that the Milky Way has spiral arms. Okay. That was slightly non-circular motions. What about the strong non-circular motions driven by the bar? And the key here is to understand the closed orbits uh, as in Athens, you, you, you know very well. So I will give a, a brief, very brief introduction to orbit theory. Uh, I take the simplest possible uh, Barrett potential, and this is composed by an axisymmetric part, phi zero, plus epsilon, the strength of, and then a quadrupole. So it's a function that depends on the polar angle as a cos two theta. Uh, this is a quadrupole, so it's, it's the simplest possible Barrett potential that you can that you can have. Um, here is just a specific model that I have for my for my example. So I have a rotation curve which is flat, and then a quadrupole that is resembling what you get from an N body bar essentially. Okay, and also from now onwards, everything we do is in the frame rotating with the bar. And to understand the closed orbits, uh, the uh, best way is to start with this uh, uh, tool called the uh, Poincaré surfaces of section. So this is, we, we have to play this game. Okay, so let's start with no bar. So epsilon equals zero. And we have an orbit here in the XY plane that is rotating like this. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I hope you do. Yes. Okay. Uh, and. Now we play the following game. Every time the orbit crosses um, the y-axis from left to right, we write down on the on the right panel here the y-intercept of the crossing and the y-dot velocity of the crossing. So for a circular orbit like this, uh, it's very easy because it's always the same point, right? It's 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 like bump, bump, bump. Every round you bump at the same y, and y-dot is zero because it's circular. Okay. Now we give this orbit a small, small kick. What happens? This is what happens. Here you get an epicycle, and in this uh, plot, you get a line that circulates around the point. Can you find other closed orbits in an uh, axisymmetric potential? Yes. For example, you can find this one here. You see it's a very elongated orbit, and it's closed. Corresponds to this point. However, if I give this one a little perturbation, so a little kick, this is what happens, that the orbit actually is unstable and circulates around the circular orbit. So if you try many, many orbits here, what you get in this diagram is that all orbits circulate either around the circular orbit or around the circular orbit going on the other side. The plot here is non-symmetric because we are in the rotating frame. And the conclusion is that all orbits in a spherical potential, you can think of them essentially as excursions around the circular orbit. Okay. Now let's make the potential slightly barred. So now epsilon is 0.1. And you can find a closed orbit, which is almost circular. It's slightly non-circular, but uh, very small. You can give this orbit a little kick and you find the same as before. And you can also find the same orbit that you, you found before, essentially, this very non-elongated orbit. So everything up to here is essentially the same. However, now comes the key difference. If we give this orbit a little, a little kick, this is what, what has happened, that the orbit has become stable, uh, essentially, when the, the potential is non, uh, is non met. And then you can try many orbits, and you see that in this diagram, you get uh, islands. So um, you have the circular orbit and the, the, or the almost circular orbit and all the orbits that circulate around that, the circular orbit on the other side, and you have a, a new stable orbit, which corresponds to the elongated orbit. So when the potential is non axisymmetric you can have multiple families of, of stable closed orbits. 
And this is to show you how the diagram uh, evolves as you increase the strength of the bar. So epsilon equals zero, there is only two islands. Then here you have uh, an island corresponding to an elongated orbit and the elongated orbit uh, grows in phase space as you make the bar stronger. Okay. And uh, the two most important uh, families of closed orbits uh, in a parallel potential are called X1 orbits, which are the blue ones here uh, parallel to the major axis of the bar. And X2 orbits are the black ones here uh, perpendicular to the major axis of the bar. And uh, what happens if you run the simplest possible hydrodynamical simulation that you can imagine in exactly the same potential that I used to calculate these orbits? This is what happens, that essentially in the outer parts, the gas follows quite closely the X1 orbits. In the inner parts, follows quite closely the X2 orbits. But in the middle, there are essentially no available orbits for the gas because the X1 orbits become self-intersecting. And so the, ga the gas flow develops a, a large-scale shock that here I call a bar shock, which uh, you can think of it as, a, as a, a river, almost, that transports the gas from the outer, from the disk towards the, the ring in the center. And you can see this uh, quite clearly also if you plot the, the velocity field. So here on the left, I have a gas simulation uh, and the arrows are the velocity field. In the center, I have the, the ballistic orbit, so the closed orbits. And here I have one, the subtraction from one from the other. And you see that the subtraction is almost zero out here and inside here, but is large in the middle part. Okay. And then you can run simulations with uh, many more uh, bells and whistles. Uh, for example, here uh, I have uh, one of our simulations with the, uh, uh, we have a, a non equilibrium chemical network that allows us to keep track of uh, different chemical species like H1, H2, CO, H. We have a recipe for a star formation. So we have the star formation rate, uh, the supernova feedback, and so on. However, uh, the, um, the, 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 the large scale underlying pattern is the same. You still get the X1 orbits out, out here, the X2 orbits down here. You get the flow along these two, these two rivers. And here, if you look at the CO, for example, it's particularly clear how the gas flows really almost radially uh, down to the ring and then accretes. I'm sorry. Uh, almost like it's 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 really almost like it's a river. See here. Okay. So now we can use all this theoretical knowledge to interpret to the the LV plots and the features that I was showing before. And let's start at uh, three kiloparsec from the center and then gradually move uh, move inwards. So the bar driven spiral arms, for example. Uh, this is the three kiloparsec arm that I showed before. And what is it? Well, <clears throat> this was shown, I think, for the first time by Mulder and Lim in 1986, uh, which ran very, uh, very impressive simulations uh, for the time. Uh, that you can explain this very well as one of these uh, uh, spiral arms that are driven by the bar just outside the bar. So if you, this is the face on view, this is what the spiral arms look like in uh, uh, the LV space, and you see that they look quite similar to the to the three kiloparsec. So this is the, the current explanation for, for this. The high velocity peaks uh, is, a, is an important one. So how do you do it? Well, again, you have the data, you have a model, uh, and in the model, you see the same feature. And then in the model, you can check where this, where is this feature coming from. So if you do it, you see that essentially it comes from, from this. So the major axis of the Milky Way bar uh, is currently oriented so that it's almost aligned with the line of sight. So the line of the sun is down here and you see that the bar is almost aligned. So when you look at gas uh, here, it's on very elongated orbits and it's uh, near pericenter is going very, very fast. And so uh, the velocity is also almost aligned with the line of sight. And this gives rise to these very, very high velocities here. And note that you get this despite the rotation curve being steadily rising. The, the rotation curve defined from the gravitational potential uh, is, is not as high here as, as the velocity peaks. And this brings me also to uh, as an opportunity to, to talk about the common misconception that I always find in the literature, that 
sometimes you find a rotation curve that has a peak in the inner part. And this is done because uh, people say, okay, I have the LV plot, I have this peak here, and I can explain it if I assume circular motion and I put also a peak in the rotation curve in the inner part. Yes, in this way, you can explain the peak. However, uh, this peak is an artifact because you are assuming circular motion where the motion is, is not circular in reality. So when you find the rotation curve, for example, here I showed this one uh, from Clemens 85, that looks like this. This is okay out to uh, up to three kiloparsec from the center, but inside three kiloparsec, you, you cannot trust it. This, this peak should not be there. In reality, you should have something that, that goes down like this. So this is what a uh, more realistic rotation curve of the Milky Way should look like. Uh, by the way, this is uh, publicly, uh, publicly available. So if you are interested in modeling the potential of the Milky Way, uh, you, you can ask uh, us. Okay. Uh, forbidden velocities. So what are the forbidden velocities uh, here? Again, you look at the model, you see the same, and then in the model, you can see where is it coming from. Uh, and this is coming from the fact that uh, when you have non-circular motions, you can have stuff that is on the right side of the galactic center, which is moving away from you. This is impossible if you have circular motion. If you have circular motion, everything on the right side goes towards you, not away from you. And so uh, forbidden velocities is, is material on, on here that is moving away from you on these uh, elongated orbits. Bar lanes, well, can we see the bar lanes of the Milky Way? They are also in the drawing. <laughs> so this suggests that we should be able to, to see them. And indeed, indeed we do. Uh, same method, you look at the data, you look at the model, you see the same features, and then you see where is it coming from in the model. And these features here are, are the bar lanes of the Milky Way, essentially. And the bar lanes are connected to something that uh, uh, I find very interesting, which is these uh, extended velocity features. So in, in the LT LV diagram, uh, you can notice these very prominent features that are very peculiar because they are localized in space. Uh, however, they are extremely broad line. Like they, ha they have velocity uh, span that spans more than 100 kilometers per second, even more than 200 sometimes. You see here, uh, this is 200 kilometers per second. And some of them have been interpreted as footprints of giant magnetic loops uh, or uh, uh, also as new, some of the smallest one as new intermediate mass uh, black holes. However, my view is that uh, they are explained more naturally in the context of gas flow in a, in a bar potential. And uh, uh, here I, I, I show what I mean by this. I, I think these, these features are essentially uh, extreme collisions between gas that has been falling along the bar, one of the bar lanes. And then uh, sometimes the gas accretes onto the ring, but sometimes overshoots and just maybe brushes the ring a little bit, but flies here and then crashes on the bar lane on the opposite side. And um, at the crashing site, at the collision site, you have a gas with very different line of sight velocity bumping into another gas with very uh, with different line of sight velocity. And how this shows up in the LV diagram is through one of these vertical bridges. So the vertical bridge here is the interaction between the two clouds going at very different velocities. Uh, here is a, another view of the same thing. You see the gas is coming down from here and then here, and then gas is, was coming from the other direction here. And here you get one of these uh, big collisions. And um, I think this is also clear because you can see that the, these extended velocity features, they essentially they stop at the velocity of the bar lanes. And you can also see the secondary dust lanes that are uh, caused by the, this collision because once the gas collides, it decelerates some of the gas. And the um, what we get in the simulation is that the bar lanes splits into two, one that is going fast and one that is going slower. And so you get two parallel here, dust lanes, and you see the same in the data and the feature connecting them. So it's, it's really the, the same morphology. And recently a student uh, of uh, Adam Gin's work that I'm working with, she has done uh, zoom in observations of one of these uh, um, uh, of these clouds. And here is what, what it 
what it looks like with the uh, Alma Aka, so at a bit higher resolution. And you see you have one cloud up here, one cloud down here, and you, then you have a velocity bridge that connects connects the two. So this is the interaction of the two clouds, and these two clouds are colliding. And this is very interesting because it's a it's a very clear case of cloud collision, and you can study the physics of what happens in a, during a cloud collision uh, using it. And an obvious natural question about this is, uh, do these extreme collisions trigger star formation? As far as we know, there is no evidence of star formation in G5, so this cloud or any other uh, of these extended velocity features. So that is puzzling. However, we have Sagittarius E. Uh, what is Sagittarius E? Sagittarius E is a, is a massive star formation complex at the edge of the central molecular zone. So 1.2 degrees from the center, 170 parsecs in projection from the galactic center. Uh, and you can see it here. Uh, here is a zoom in, and every little circle is, a, is an H2 region, essentially. So this is many H2 regions. And what is peculiar about Sagittarius E is that these H2 regions have very high line of sight velocities. Here in this plot, there are all the known H2 regions from the WISE catalog. And you see that all the other H2 regions are here, except Sagittarius E is this bunch of uh, uh, H2 regions down here at minus 200 kilometers per second. And we tried to uh, use the, the simulations to see where this could be coming from. And our interpretation is that this is a complex that is currently at the, uh, essentially at the, at the end of the bar lane on the far side of the galaxy. And because these H2 regions are evolved, they have ages of a few mega years, they should be born upstream along the bar lane, roughly, roughly here, so mid in the middle of the bar lane. So the open question is, was the formation of Sagittarius E triggered by, by a G-like collision? Maybe there is a delay between the collision and the actual start of the, of the star formation. And finally, getting even closer to the center, we get to the central molecular zone. So what is the central molecular zone? Um, the central molecular zone is what the name says. It's an accumulation of very dense gas in the center. Uh, you can see this in this plot, for example, where the gray is a CO, so it's molecular gas, and the yellow is ammonia, so it's gas denser than CO. And you see that the ammonia is very, very concentrated in the center. And uh, what is it? Again, you look at the model, you kind of see the same type of structure here. And essentially this is the star forming ring that you often find not only in the Milky Way, but in many, many uh, barred galaxies. So the central molecular zone is the counterpart of this, of this star forming ring. Uh, one of the questions that has been puzzling for a, a while is why is the central molecular zone gas distribution asymmetric? You can see that uh, most of the gas is on the left of the galactic center and only a quarter of the gas is on the right of the galactic center in the central molecular zone. And why is this? There was apparently no reason to expect a symmetry based on the X1, X2 orbits picture. And the early simulations seem to indeed confirm, confirm this. However, uh, a few years ago, we noticed that when we run the simple 2D simulations at very high resolution, uh, we get this. And at first, this was very weird. So we thought um, maybe it's a numerical artifact. We are not doing something uh, correctly. Also because our simulations were very simple. We didn't have any gas self-gravity. We didn't have any star formation, nothing special, just isothermal gas flowing in an externally imposed barrel potential. But we thought maybe if it's real, could it explain why the CMZ is asymmetric? And uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions later, but the, the short answer is that we studied these, uh, uh, these features in more detail uh, using an idealized setup where we could also do a linear stability analysis. And we found that actually it's, it's a real thing, it's a real instability of the shock front. And it's called wiggle instability. And uh, what this causes is that the bar shock breaks into clumps and then these clumps uh, can accrete onto the ring. And when they accrete, they perturb it. 
and they can actually generate quite a lot of, uh, of disruption, which uh, can make the CMZ asymmetric. Uh, for example, in this snapshot of the simulation, uh, you see that the, the gas ring is asymmetric with respect to this line and roughly three quarters on one side and a quarter is on the other side. So like, like in the Milky Way. And in these simulations, we tried everything we could to make it uh, uh, symmetric. So we started with very symmetric initial conditions. We don't have self-gravity, no star formation, no nothing. And yet you, you develop naturally this, uh, this asymmetry. Uh, so it, it looks like it can happen in the simulation. Of course, this doesn't exclude that star formation and feedback and maybe the, the black hole, they can cause also further disruption. But uh, our point was that you don't need these extra processes to, to explain the, the asymmetry. Um, another good question is why is the gas stream in the, the gas streams in the CMZ oscillating vertically? So here I show again the, uh, the CMZ, this time is a picture from Molinari et al. And you see in dark here, you get these dense gas streams and they don't lie in the galactic plane. So the galactic plane is uh, B, B equals zero. So it's in the middle and they oscillate up and down by 20 parsecs, 30 parsecs. Um, and what we noticed is that also in simulations, the the CMZ ring sometimes uh, wobbles a little bit, so it doesn't stay exactly in the plane, but it, it wobbles a little bit like a coin on a table by an angle of a few degrees, so two, three, four degrees. Um, and in the simulations, this seems to be induced by tilted feeding from the bar lanes. So the bar lanes, they don't accrete onto the CMZ in the plane exactly, but the accretion comes a little bit uh, with a vertical momentum. And then when this momentum is transferred to the ring, it causes these this vertical oscillations. And uh, interestingly, interestingly, in the Milky Way, the bar lanes are actually tilted. So you see here the blue and the red are the bar lanes, and they are not in the galactic plane, but they are at an angle of a few degrees. And if you make a simple order of magnitude estimate, you find that this should induce vertical oscillations comparable to the observed ones on a few mega years uh, time scales. Of course, then uh, there is another question that is like, okay, but why are these uh, tilted? And uh, this, I don't know the answer. Uh, it's an open question why there seems to be a large scale tilt in the innermost uh, three, four kiloparsecs of the gas uh, in the Milky Way. So the final picture that we get is that you have all these features but you can give a coherent interpretation to most of these, of these features in the context of gas flow in the bar potential. So it's important to have this as a, as a framework to, to interpret the observations. And of course, you can also invert this and use this to constrain the galactic potential. So you run simulations where you have a few parameters, uh, for example, the bar pattern speed, the bar length, the bar strength, and so on. And then you match the LV diagrams to the, to the observations and you constrain the parameters. And in this way, for example, we uh, constrain the bar pattern speed to be lower than the value that was taught at the time, um, which was about 60 kilometers per second per kiloparsec. And um, uh, actually, so I was a PhD student at this time and uh, Bini was very skeptical about this at the beginning because he said like everybody knows that the bar is uh, uh, is faster and so on. Um, but then uh, we were convinced and a few years later, Gaia confirmed, confirmed that the bar actually was, was slower than was previously thought. So this kind of anticipated revision in the bar pattern speed that was later confirmed by, by Gaia. Okay, so this was my initial introduction to the, to the gas dynamics and then I, I move to the second part. So how is the gas transported from the galactic disk on kiloparsec scales to the central black hole Sagittarius A star? And schematically, you can think about this in a, as a sequence of steps. You have a first step, which is from the galactic disk to the central molecular zone, which is performed by the galactic bar. And I think this is relatively well understood. And then you have uh, from the CMZ to the circunuclear disk, which is this disk uh, much smaller, uh, three, four kilo, uh, sorry, three, four parsecs from the center. 
and then from this to the area of influence of such a star, which is inside the innermost parsec. So uh, let's start with the with the first step, the bar driven inflow. I showed before that here you have the, the CMZ in the data, you can see in the in the model. You can see also the bar lanes. And if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can see that there is a vertical ridge here connecting the bar lane to the to the central molecular zone. And this is essentially the accretion that is taking place. So in 2019, we thought, okay, maybe we can use this to get an estimate of the accretion rate onto the CMZ directly from the data, just using a very simple geometrical model. We know where the bar lanes are. Uh, we just model them as two rivers that uh, accrete into the center uh, geometrically. And um, what we found is that the, the accretion rate, the raw result that we got was about 2.7 solar masses per year. Then we corrected this with uh, Perry Hatchfield, a student based in the University of Connecticut, to account for the fact that not all the gas is accreting immediately, but some of the gas is overshooting and then accretes maybe later. And this was lower to approximately one solar mass per year. And this agrees reasonably well with what we get for, uh, from, the, from the simulations. Um, okay. So what about the next step, which is the nuclear inflow? Uh, here, I want to show this, uh, I think is a very clean uh, numerical experiment. So here I show two simulations, which are identical, except that the one on the left has no self gas self-gravity and no star formation. The one on the right has star formation and, and supernova feedback. And you see that the uh, gas here accumulates in the CMZ ring, but then inside the ring is empty. There is really almost, there is zero gas. While here inside the ring, you get, you get some gas. It's a lower density than in the ring, but there is a, a flow. And indeed, if you measure the bar inflow in the two simulations is the same, which means the bar is responsible for the accretion onto the ring. But from the ring inwards is exactly zero in the left and is something 0 0.03 solar masses per year. Uh, in the one on the right. And this could seem small, but it's actually very significant if you think in terms of the, the total mass of the circumnuclear disk or the accretion onto the, the black hole. Then, of course, you can repeat the same experiment, but this time, instead of turning on the, the star formation, you turn on the magnetic fields and you get more or less the same result. So here is no magnetic fields, here is with magnetic fields, and you feel the inside of the ring and you get an accretion rate, which is 0 0.01, 0 0.1 solar masses per year. So you have several possible inflow mechanisms. And uh, for two of them, we have an estimate of the number at least. However, we don't know how this compares. Like, we don't know what happens if we have the stellar feedback and the uh, MHD turbulence together. They could interact non-linearly. Uh, we don't know if we what happens if we include the uh, other type of uh, feedback, such as uh, stellar winds or the ionizing radiation from the massive stars. We don't know what could be the effect of external perturbations, such as uh, passing globular clusters. There are several that have orbits that can intersect, uh, that intersect the galactic center. And also, uh, there could be a secondary bar in the Milky Way. We don't know. Uh, but if there is, then everything would be different. Uh, what, what we know would be uh, completely different because uh, you, you could repeat the same process that the large scale bar does on large scales. You could repeat it on a smaller scale in the center. Okay. Um, so finally, we move to the, to the last part, which is, which is star formation. Uh, here, I, I would like to advertise our uh, recent review uh, Henshaw et al. Uh, for the Protostars and Planet uh, 7 conference on this topic. Um, so here is the central molecular zone and is a three color image where the red is the cold gas and dust and the green and blue is the, is the warm dust heated by the young stars, for example. And uh, the idea is that the CMZ is a system that like this one, so it's a nuclear ring but you are seeing it edge on because we are living inside the galaxy. Uh, 
now we have also JWST, so you can you can see the same galaxy in JWST, and again you 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 see the the, the ring very very beautiful, uh, and also all the the gas flow uh, surrounding it, uh, because with JWST you have very high sensitivity for for the gas. And here is another example, and you see ten nine uh, thirteen zero zero, and again has been observed with JWST by the Fangs collaboration, and uh, the idea is that. The CMZ is like one of these one of these systems, and um, here I label a few a few objects. So the galactic center is here. You have uh, here the densest uh, molecular clouds. So this is the gas that is mostly on the left when I talked about the the asymmetry. Is all this uh, red stuff here? You have embedded star formation here. You have the central bubble here, probably caused by multiple supernovae, and then you have these compact uh, infrared sources which some of them might be young stars, some of them might be more evolved stars. It's, it's a little bit uh, debated. And um, one reason why people talked a lot about the CMZ in the last uh, uh, few years uh, is because they say um, it forms, uh, uh, it's inefficient at forming stars. So I thought I, I would uh, clarify what this means. Here I show uh, two star formation relations. On the left is the most famous, let's say, uh, Schmidt uh, star formation relation, which is the schmidt kennicott relation. And you see that the Milky Way CMZ is roughly consistent with the relation. So it's a little bit below maybe, but it's not, it, it's within the scatter. On the right, I show the Gao, Solomon, and Lada relation. And this is the relation where the CMZ is, is inconsistent with. But what is this relation? This relation is the relation between the dense gas which means gas denser than traced by CO. So this is not molecular gas, it's gas denser than just molecular. Traced, for example, by uh, HCN or ammonia or other high density gas tracers. And on the y-axis, you put the star formation rate. So in this relation, which seems to be valid for Milky Way clouds and also for uh, uh, integrated external galaxies, the Milky Way is a little bit, is a little bit below. Okay, and now you can also do a mass balance in the CMZ with all of these because you have uh, the inflow, which is roughly one solar mass per year. You have the star formation rate, which is 0.1 solar mass per year. Uh, and then you have the outflow. So here is the, the CMZ and you see this big bubble here is the large scale outflow. So mass is also outflowing on the Milky Way. And according to papers by Bordolo and Di Teodoro, you can look at this in warm gas, uh, neutral gas, molecular gas. If you sum all the contributions together, you get something of the order 0.6 solar mass per year, which is very uncertain. So you have one solar mass per year coming in, and then 10% is used as star formation. 50, 60% or more is uh, uh, blown out as, as an outflow. And currently, this looks roughly consistent with the a rough, a rough balance, let's say. So you have what you get in is consumed the star formation and then thrown out, but there is no big accumulation of, of, of mass, possibly. It's very uncertain. Um, an interesting question is uh, how is the star formation specially distributed and are there preferred location for star formation? And here there are three scenarios that have been proposed. One is the popcorn scenario, which says, you have the gas ring and the star formation happens randomly and uniformly all along in the ring. You have the personal string scenario, which says star formation is triggered preferentially at the apocenter. So you should find uh, a, a age sequence here where the youngest stars are, are closer to the apocenter and then they get older as you go downstream. And then there is the pericenter passage scenario, which is essentially the personal string but rotated by 90 degrees. Here, the, the star formation is triggered at the pericenter because of, of the tidal compression, essentially. Uh, so which scenario is correct? If you look at the observations, it's unclear because there is an intriguing, intriguing sequence of, uh, uh, like you start from the brick molecular cloud, which has almost no star formation, although it's very dense. And then you have a little bit more star formation here and then a lot of star formation here. However, if you look at the CMZ globally, we, th there is no clear uh, trend. And uh, because I'm a theorist, what, what about the simulations? 
Well, what we see is that if you look at the instantaneous star formation rate, so here in the color is the star formation rate and in the gray is the, is the gas in the background, there is no clear pattern. Like if you look at any single snapshot, you cannot support or disprove any of the scenarios. However, the patterns emerge when you time average the, the simulation. So if you time average over 30 mega years, then you see that there are some regions where star formation happens more often and some where star formation happens less, less often. And what we see is that essentially the, the, the time average trend is, is a mix of the popcorn, the person and string. So it's mostly random. However, it happens a little bit more often at the, at the opposite end. However, my, my take, unfortunately, is that this is very hard, if not maybe impossible to test observationally because in the observations, you cannot take the, the time average. Um, so what you would need to do is maybe to look at many galaxies have a lot of statistics, but it's very hard because every galaxy is, is, is different. Okay. Um, and the last topic is uh, what happens when the star formation, the CMZ continues for several giga years? Well, it, stars accumulate and build up a structure that uh, is known as the nuclear stellar disk. So here I show the nuclear stellar disk in the star counts from the K-band from Nishiyama et al. This is the nuclear stellar disk, the green uh, stuff. And you should not confuse it, should not be confused with the nuclear star cluster, which is a much smaller structure here, uh, the red structure in the center. So just to give you a few numbers, the total mass of the nuclear disk is about 10 to the nine solar masses. It has a radius of 120 parsecs, a scale height of 45 parsecs. It dominates the gravitational potential of the Milky Way between 30 and 300 parsecs from the center. And as far as we know, it could be non-axisymmetric. So it could be a secondary bar, uh, but this is very, very hard to, to say. And uh, the connection between the gas and the stars is clear if you because the, the, the dense gas in the CMZ overlaps perfectly with the, with the size of the, of the nuclear stellar disk. So the nuclear stellar disk is the product of the star formation happening in this gas. And you can see uh, this also from the rotation. Uh, the nuclear stellar disk rotates. Here I show uh, the red is uh, moving away from you. The uh, blue is moving towards you. And you see that the nuclear disk is, is clearly, clearly rotating. And is rotating with uh, gas, uh, with velocities for the gas and stars, which are similar. So that also strengthens the, the connection between the two. Uh, and the, what is the evolution of the nuclear disk? The, the most plausible scenario is this inside out formation scenario that was proposed by Bittner et al for uh, external galaxies. It says that nuclear disks are built up from a series of gaseous rings that grow in radius over time. So here I show NGC 1097, for example. Uh, and you see that um, uh, the age, so look at the age here, the dashed line is the edge of, of the nuclear disk. So it is the, the end of the nuclear disk and the age of the stars decreases as you go out. So the idea is that uh, uh, stars formed first in the center and then gradually moved, moved out. And this is supported by, by simulations. Um, you see here the simulation from CO et al, 2019, and you see that uh, as giga years uh, pass, the, 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 the ring grows. Um, so here I show a zoom in of the same picture and you see this and initially the ring is, is very, very small and then it grows. Okay. And um, this can be used to time the formation of the bar also, because in the simulations, you see that uh, soon after the bar forms, uh, you form a, most of the mass of the nuclear disk. So you get this big peak in the, in the star formation rate. So if you look at the star formation history of the nuclear disk, you can, you can use this to, to, to uh, time the, to, to find the, how old is the bar essentially. And uh, this is what the observations show. You show, they show that you have a, a big star formation event. So maybe it's the formation of the bar 10, 8, 10 giga years ago or more. Then you have a period with very little star formation, which is maybe a little bit puzzling because why there was no star formation in this, in this period. And then you have sustained star formation in the last uh, giga year or so. One possible solution to, to this is that indeed you have a, the inside out formation scenario. So we have now also evidence for the inside out formation scenario in the Milky Way. Uh, 
Nogueras Lara tried to do the star formation history by radius. So he looked at the inner region of the nuclear disk, and then he found that all the stars are older than seven giga years. But then when he moves to the outer parts of the nuclear disk, there are uh, many stars that have formed between two and seven giga years ago. So this, again, is in the same uh, the same trend that you see for the external galaxies like uh, the NGC 1097 that I showed before. And finally, I, I because I'm already late uh, with time, I don't want to go into details of this, but recently we did a, a very detailed a dynamical modeling of the nuclear disk. Um, I will not talk about the, the motivations. Uh, I just want to, to show you that. Um, uh, so what we did is we looked at uh, these uh, observational fields. And then for each field, we had a, a line of sight, uh, kinematic information, and uh, proper motion uh, information. So we had 3D velocities. And we fitted the kinematics in each field. And in this way, we constrained a few parameters, like the total mass, the radius, the scale height and the velocity dispersion of, of the nuclear disk. And uh, um, this is basically all the models available for the nuclear disk. Uh, there is our model, there was our previous genes model, and then there is a photometric uh, genes model from uh, Launhardt et al. So the nuclear disk is uh, something that uh, is beginning to be studied now because data is becoming available. And I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, avenue for, for, uh, for the future. OK. I think I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. So many thanks, uh, Mattia, for this uh, very, really, very, very interesting talk. Very nice uh, results and nice presentation. There is time for questions. First of all, let me see if there's somebody here in the audience who wants to ask something. Uh, we move, OK, to people. So Peter is calling. So Peter, you may ask your question. Um, hi, Matthias. Very, very nice, very interesting talk. Um, two questions or comments. One is your modeling of the gas flow for the Milky Way. You're assuming the bar is basically a, a uniformly flat structure, I'm thinking. The reason I ask is because the real Milky Way bar, of course, has a vertically inflated inner zone, the boxy peanut bulge. And I'm wondering if the difference between that and a kind of uniform uh, thin disk bar would have much effect on the gas flow. So um, actually we, we don't assume it's it's flat. So in the, in the older models, we assumed that um, uh, it, it's, it's, like a, it's, it's like a cigar. So uh, it has one major axis, and then the other two axes are the same uh, uh, length. So the, the width of the minor axis of the bar, they are the same. Um, and in the newer models that we are doing now, we so what we did was we took the Portail Letal and body bar from, uh, uh, yeah, from Portail Letal, so the, the group of Ortwin Gerard. They did this. They have essentially the, the best model available for the structure of the Milky Way bar. Uh, and we made uh, an analytic fit to that uh, uh, density distribution, uh, which is very accurate. So we also reproduce, for example, the X shape of the bar and so on. Uh, and now we have an analytic formula. And uh, from this, we can calculate the potential. And uh, uh, so it's, it's thick, as thick as the, as the real uh, bar. And we, we don't see a lot of difference in the, in the plane, I have to say. Um, Okay. Um, my second, well, my 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 comment was about the idea of the inside-out growth model for nuclear stellar disks, and I'm a little hesitant about that because there are some external galaxies where you can see a nuclear star-forming ring that is currently forming stars um, embedded in a what appears to be a nuclear stellar disk, which is larger than the ring. Like NGC thirteen hundred, one of the galaxies you showed briefly. The, the okay. there is a star forming nuclear ring there, and there is a nuclear stellar disk which is let's say very roughly twice the size of the nuclear ring. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, uh, that's very interesting. Um, but then, how how do you form? 
how do you form the how did the the where where are the stars forming the disc coming from? Um, I, I I don't know. That's that's, that's more <laughs> job than mine. But let, let let me make a remark on that. So it is a known discrepancy, if you want, or a known open question that if you go to models uh, and uh, calculate, let's like, say, the extent of the X two orbits. And then you see in the gas response where the ring is formed, usually they do not uh, overlap. The, the, the nuclear ring is uh, uh, smaller than the largest X2 orbits, if you want, and rounder. So, uh, and this happens even in simple models that you just do not have star formation, whatever, you just take the, the gas response and then you see, you calculate, you find the X2 orbits and then you find the ring. And there is this, so that, that points certainly to some hydrodynamical uh, dynamical mechanisms that uh, lead to this smaller ring. They are in the same area, but uh, the, the, the gaseous nuclear ring is smaller than the X2 orbits, if it could help. Yes, yes. So that is that is true. And like like uh, Panos showed in, in in 2000, it depends on the sound speed uh, a lot. For example, of, of the gas, uh, so the orbits remain the same if you change the sound speed, but uh, the size of the ring size changes. Of the ring changes, yeah. Well, but then then you still have the question of of okay, the stars sort of could be orbiting out there, but how did they get out there? If that's exactly not exactly, form? so that's my question. So to me, the inside out makes a lot of sense because. Uh, if you look at the simulations, uh, the size of the ring depends on this, the slope of the rotation curve in the center, or like how mass, how the, the mass concentration that you have in the center. If you increase the mass concentration in the center in your potential, the rings gets bigger. So it makes sense that as you accumulate mass, then you change slowly the rotation curve in the center so that the, the ring becomes a little bit bigger, uh, and then the process continues so how do you make how do you so it is grows and then at some point you have to make the ring smaller again maybe i'm just speculating but maybe one way is if you heat up the gas enough and so you increase the sound speed then <laughs> it, it shrinks again uh, yeah okay maybe <laughs> thanks Okay, so let me check if there are some other people who want to ask from about some questions. Uh, so uh, one thing that, uh, okay, uh, Mattia, let's move a little bit outside of the center of the galaxy. Uh, the flow uh, in the, okay, right, <laughs> okay, the right dimension. Okay, so the flow at, uh, in the dust lane regions in the main bar, it's certainly not uh, exactly along the dust lane. So gas is coming, shocks, loses uh, uh, angular momentum, goes on the other side, and then meets again the, the dust lane on the other side. Do you agree with this picture, right? Yes. Okay, okay. So, uh, and uh, also another thing is that in most cases, at least in the uh, usual models that... Uh, us and many other people have been simple, like in the uh, simple uh, bar potential you have shown in the beginning or Ferrer's bars, etc. cetera. Um, the area inside the inner limit resonance has just uh, again X1 orbits, or there is, it's very simple uh, underlines uh, orbital structure. However, in other cases, when you go to models uh, that you estimate from near infrared observations in galaxies, like in the NGC 1300, you have there, I can uh, remember, well, the uh, 4314 that we have uh, studied in the 90s and the other in other cases. Okay, the, the, the potential is not accurate in the center because you have a, a spherical bulge there, et cetera, et cetera. But in any case, in the models, you have a very a much richer orbital uh, structure. Now, this is also an open question. Uh, what about if uh, there are uh, more complicated underlying uh, stellar orbital structures in the area? Are they, do they play any role or it is the gas uh, 
uh, that dense in the region that uh, we have to think just about uh, hydrodynamic processes for understanding the, the final part of the flow towards the center of the galaxy. Okay, this mm -hmm. is main a comment. I don't so know. just just a comment on your so yes, um, I think basically I think if you look at this JWST picture. These these streams are, are tracing the gas streamline yes, almost yes, exactly. Um, so it's true that you have that the gas also comes out here. Yes. But we try to follow this with tracer particles in the simulations, and if you just want to get any an estimate of the inflow, it's not too bad to just assume that this is like a river and okay. goes to the center because thirty percent of the gas actually does that. So. It's 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 not too bad. Um, um, I agree that then the picture is more complicated, yeah. but yeah, certainly because else, uh, all uh, let's say that uh, in a giga year, or so the, the the potential doesn't uh, change dramatically. So if it was like that, then all the gas will come from one side, find the shocks, and then go to the center, and then you should have a second round. So certainly, <laughs> <laughs> certainly yeah. there is some. Part of it, a percentage of it, a major percentage, I would say, that circulates. Of course, I have for me the picture is it goes shocks, goes on the other side, and a smaller uh, radius, and then again, and then again, spiraling into the center. This uh, or to the to the nuclear ring, maybe. Yes, but even even if you look at, it's not doing many rounds. It's like if, on average, you do like two rounds or uh, maybe three at most. Not not so many. Um, but so then it's, it's have quite some, fast some thing, so. replenishes the gas since we see it, see it there. Where is the, the gas coming from now? If it is just two dynamical times, then uh, this, would, this would be an empty area because I guess that it has, well, uh, it, it should have done more than two rounds around the center of the galaxy, the gas. Uh, yeah, actually, it is very fast because what you see in the simulations is that if you don't have any, any mechanism that can replenish this area, in yeah. two, three hundred mega years, everything is empty. <laughs> there is nothing more circulating here. So that is one of my open questions, actually. If it's so efficient, the bar, in driving the gas to the center, what is replenishing this region? So either the bar is not as efficient as we get from the simulations, or you get some, some inflow from outside to that replenishes the bar, the bar region here. Um, so that I don't know. The, regarding... Your other questions about the orbits, I think it depends on what kind of orbits you have in mind. So if you have a, a secondary bar, then of course you have completely different orbital structure uh, in the center. Look, uh, well, I think that mostly is unpublished work what I'm speaking about, but what I have seen is that uh, in uh, this kind of potential, I think I have three, four cases and uh, there is, uh, there are resonance inside the two to one, so one to one, and mm. by forgetting families out of that, so in uh, some few tens of parsec scale, you can find orbits that, uh, but precess, there are like eight shaped, inclined eight shaped, eight shaped loops, things like that. Yeah, but the the problem I don't you, know you if think... they play any role in that small distance and if the gas is there dominating. That's that's the point. Yeah. I think in the gas, you don't really get those orbits because they, when they have loops, uh, the gas doesn't follow. Oh, them. Doesn't, doesn't follow. And I think that this is a nice result also from a recent paper I had with uh, Stavros Pastras, who I think actually he's in here. Uh, we said that, look, uh, uh, this, this the straight line dust lane shocks can be traced exactly until the distance from the center where the x1 family starts making loops then things become complicated and then you can have some patterns that can be um, compared with these flows so i fully agree with whatever whenever of course it is a, a loop then uh, the, the, the the nice picture stops and then are complicated things but okay maybe there can be a a, a, a kind of uh, and uh, spiral arm, etc. Oh, speaking about spiral uh, things, etc. Then we have some cases uh, leading and, and uh, well and trailing spirals towards the center, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this yes. is again a, a hydrodynamical effect, or it is something that has to do with the underlying potential. 
So on that, I, I'm I'm writing a paper now uh, okay. <laughs> because I, so you know there is this question that I never I didn't I didn't mention it in the talk, but what actually sets the size of the ring? Like why is it this size and not twice this size or half this size, right? Yeah. And um, as you as you know, there are several theories. So yeah. one is that the ring is at the size is the size of the inner limbic resonance. Yes. Uh, then there are. Uh, some some theories from Lechetal in the 90s and that have been revived recently by Kramholz and Kreuzen that say uh, you should look at the, the shear. So the, the, yeah, they, yeah. they look at the accretion disks and they make an analogy and they say, okay, viscous accretion disks, mm. uh, the transport is more efficient where there is more shear. So you look at the point of minimum shear, that's where the gas accumulates. Yeah, I know uh... Yes, well, and there are others. I also published a paper in 2018, yeah. uh, but my current view is that all these papers are wrong. <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> we would uh, be very interested uh, to to discuss. Maybe if uh, if I'm coming to Granada, then we have uh, plenty of time to discuss about this because exactly Stavros and I uh, are writing also a paper on this, so we may have okay. an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I I, uh, I hope. By Granada, my paper will be will be out. Uh, no, not of uh, not ours, uh, but okay. I can uh, certainly bring material with me so that we discuss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Very nice, very nice. So, any other question? If not, let's uh, thank Matia again. Thank you for being with us. Thank we you. The talk. So, okay, then we stop here. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.